One of the uh, unpleasant aspects of filmmaking is that you have to deal with people, and they get in the way. For example, you have to have a crew. You have to have cameramen and sound men and people to push things and hang lights, and they argue with you, and then they need to be paid, and they have to eat, and they got to go to hotels, and they don't like sleeping on the floor, and, and they argue with you about the script, and, and, and wouldn't it be great if you didn't need any of these people, if you could do everything by yourself? Well, there's a guy in Indiana, and his name is Randy DeFord. He's figured out how to do that. He's created and built equipment. He's built his own damn equipment so that he could make a movie called Purge Claws and not have any uh, crew. Oh, hi. My name is Randy DeFord. I'm an independent filmmaker from Monticello, Indiana. That's uh, up in northern Indiana in corn country. Some time back, I made a short science fiction drama called Purge Claws, which featured Lloyd Kaufman of Troma Entertainment as the lead actor. During that shoot, I had brought some of my homemade film equipment. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer as a living, and he said, Randy, I'm working on a project called Make Your Own Damn Movie. Uh, why don't you show me some of that equipment and maybe just a little bit about Monticello, Indiana? Okay. First piece is my audio or my microphone boom. Uh, I don't like to boom with a human because there's too much motion. If it doesn't call for it, I'd much rather use a stationary microphone which stays in the same place. The uh, stem of this is actually a stem from an industrial fan that would be used in a factory or someplace. It has a center section very similar to what would be used in a microphone stand so I can loosen that part, that silver part, and I can raise it in order to lift the boom up above head level so that it's out of the way of the camera. The pivot part of this is a couple brackets that was made by a machinist friend of mine and then I put a bolt through with several washers and a wing nut. Then you tighten down on the washers and this gives the arm the ability to be moved back and forth but it will stay wherever you put it because the microphone is so light it just simply does not weigh it down. If for some reason it would get loose, you just simply tighten the wing nut a little more and it's back the way it was before. Works out perfectly. The actual boom part of the stand is a one inch square aluminum tube or pipe. You can buy it at any hardware store. Mounted on top of that is a broken car wash wand. You can also buy it at any department store. And then the uh, center portion here extends just like a microphone stand. And then this portion raises just like a microphone stand. And I can get over the heads of everyone, keep the mic in the same place, everything consistent. Don't need the human. That's why I only want Lloyd to deliver one line Ooh. so I can change shots. <laughs> well, what we have here is uh, my dolly system, a six foot section that can set up in about two minutes. So I'm going to show you how this works. Uh, it consists of a couple pieces of angle iron, some aluminum, a uh, special mount that I made here to put the tripod on and uh, something to pull it with, and uh, a couple of sandbags. This is how it's used. In case you hadn't noticed yet, one of my super high-tech devices is this thing right here. And I'll take off the sandbag and pull this through, and you'll see that this is a paint roller. Uh, this works rather well as the puller because not only does it uh, extend into different positions, but it also lets you both pull or push the device depending on what you want to do. I took this and put a piece of plastic tube over here, put three eye screws. This fits through like this. Therefore, it's quiet, and I can also pull it out so that I can push or pull, depending on what I need. Paint roller. Here's one of my favorite dolly shots from my film, Section 5. As you see, it just goes from right to left, from right to left, and the shots aren't very long, they just have transitions between, and they're tastefully mixed. 
Oh, here's another one of my high-tech devices. Uh, this is a microphone windscreen. Actually made from a seat cushion. You know, you can buy them at a fabric shop for a couple bucks. Cut out a section, take a very sharp Stanley knife and just whittle it down. And then split it in two. Make a section for your microphone in here. Put the microphone inside. Windscreen works really well. Here's another piece of equipment that Lloyd wanted me to be sure and share with you. This is my uh, my jib arm or my jib crane. Uh, the base is a again an industrial fan base works very well because it's tapped with a one and a half inch uh, regular plumbing pipe. So I can use that as the stem, and it goes in just like this. It goes in fast and easy, and uh, you can make it any length you want. The uh, pivot point, which is called the clevis, you can buy these uh, warehouse, but uh, a friend of mine made this, and then we screwed into the cap on a, a plumbing one and a half inch OD and uh, that is actually the rotation point and the pivot point of the jib. The uh, jib arm itself is a couple pieces of these are actually aluminum joists that are used in uh, to create a room, a portable room. Those were in the trash where I worked one time and of course they let me have them because they were going to throw them away. They're already pre-tapped so you can take them and lay them on top of each other and change the position to where they are. Uh, and then, of course, just regular weights to uh, counteract the moment or the torque when the camera is on there. So I'll show you what this looks like when it's all put together. Okay, here's the uh, jib after it's been assembled. If you look down at here, you'll see the base, as I showed. And then the two pieces which are connected together. See, they slide up and down one each other. So you can change the length of the arm itself. Now, the mounting end where the camera goes is just a piece of aluminum that I formed and then I put a couple rubber bumpers on the bottom and up here where this piece hangs are spring loaded with the wing nuts. here. Here's the pivot point and then here are the weights to counterbalance so that the camera is on so when the jib goes up make its nice sweeping movements up and down balanced. Another thing that some people don't think about with jibs, since this jib is not very heavy actually, it's aluminum and just a little bit of pipe, you could actually set this jib up on top of a porch or on the back of a pickup truck and you automatically gain a lot more uh, distance that you can go. So in other words, if this was on the back of a pickup truck, I could take this clear up in the air and then bring it down clear to the ground but I've already got quite a bit more length just because I've put it up three or four foot higher in a truck. Nice little trick that doesn't cost anything. The next two clips you're going to see were shot using this jib. The first one is an inside shot in a motel room from the short film Purge Claws. It shows a slow sweep from the right side of the room over the bed to the left side of the room to where the two occupants are sitting having a conversation. Everything we print is not only logged, but it's sent to an unknown location to monitor all activity by my group. The only reason I even saw it was because it was sent level 17, which is my security clearance. That also means that somebody will eventually realize the mistake. I will be in grave danger. The purge clause will be activated. The second shot is from my full-length feature, Section 5. This is a story about a woman who leaves home when she's young and then comes back to inherit her father's estate after he's died. She's been away for some years and her father really didn't care that much about taking care of the place. We wanted to get a sense that it was overgrown and also sweep across and be sure that we saw what the landscape looked like. See the woman get out of her car, walk up to the house, stand for a moment and contemplate and then go ahead and walk into the house that she has now inherited. And I wanted it to be one continuous shot with no edits and that's what I got with this jib arm. Monticello is a small town of about 5,000 people that sits along two lakes in northwestern Indiana, about two hours south of Chicago. It's a rural community, mostly farming, lots of flat landscape, and it's one of the top pork producing regions in the whole United States. It's also about 25 minutes north of Lafayette, Indiana, which is home to Purdue University.
You must be Suzanne. Thank you for seeing me, Doctor. I, I realize this must be a huge inconvenience for you, but let me explain. You seem a bit rattled. Uh, uh, Boris told me there were some issues uh, of serious nature. Uh, uh, why don't you just relax and sit down, sit down, please. Thank you. Ah, so, uh, where would you like to start? There's just so much. Well, look, take a couple of breaths. Get some oxygen into your system and You'll feel better about proceeding. As you know, I work for Graham and Tate. Boris told me as much, but gave me no details. He just said you were, you were a good friend and that you were troubled. I work as a data cipher or a sand scrambler. I, I take bits of data that have been deleted or destroyed and reiterated, or I take bits of data and break it down so that it can be transmitted without detection and then recombined later. So you're some kind of a super problem solver? Yes. Or? Yes. Digital manipulation on a precision level. Hmm. Go on. You might guess that I have access to the most sensitive information that anyone can view. There's only one security clearance level above my own. I have seen data things you can't even imagine. And I have been trained, basically, to observe and forget. Well, I can understand that in terms of national security, but what puzzles me is, wouldn't your company be providing you with some psychological services? And, 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 and certainly they don't want you divulging sensitive information to a third party. I mean, wasn't there a contract? Didn't you have to sign something? And didn't it include a confidentiality clause or something along those lines? Yes, I have. And part of that agreement is the purge clause. And what's that? That is the last paragraph that says that you both accept and agree to the company terminating you should you reveal any classified information. Yeah, but surely with your qualifications and, and abilities, you'd be able to get a wonderful prestigious job with another company if you were asked to leave. No, I didn't say asked to leave. I said, terminated. So, you're telling me that this company has you sign a contract that permits them to take your life if you breach certain data. Well, it shouldn't surprise me, but it does. And of course, that leads to the next logical question. What exactly is the data or whatever that would activate this purge clause? Well, I said I had top-level clearance, but not the highest. Information that would be viewed by the highest level op would not be viewed by me. So what are we talking about? Black ops, assassinations, blackmail? Uh... Oh, no, no, I see that stuff, only I see it in fractured data, so I probably wouldn't know what it was. Even if I did see it whole, even if I do see it, I forget it. It doesn't matter to me. I just don't care. Here, let me give you an example. Um, what does this word mean to you? To take a life. But do you agree that it otherwise has no meaning except for as a verb? Well, certainly nothing much in that form. Okay. Now, how about... What is this phrase? Uh, an important person. Uh, but together? Oh, I understand. Mm. So, so go on, go on. Several days ago, I received an incoming stream on my clearance level. I opened it. It wasn't encrypted, so I started to read. Did you ever wonder how mankind developed intellect? Did you ever wonder if maybe Darwin did get it wrong? Indeed I have, but 
but not so reflectively that I'd lay awake at night thinking and cogitating how did apes transform into homo sapiens. <laughs> no. <laughs> Me neither. Now I don't. Because I know. As you know, Egyptians are given credit for their great strides in astronomy, particularly in regards to temple and pyramid science. The classified dossier that I accidentally received gave details on how that happened. According to the document, aliens came here in 4760 BC to prepare a home for a dying planet. And what might that planet be? The planet's name by the alien's description is pronounced Utohefma, the fourth planet from the sun of the central system. Mars? But Mars cannot sustain life. Not now. If man were to finally reach a point of total annihilation via nuclear weapons, what would this planet look like? Mostly like a burnt out cinder. Aha, uh -huh. I understand. What if we knew that a catastrophe would happen in 50 years here on Earth? What would we try to do? Well, we would try to perpetuate our race, of course. And if you had the technology to send people to the next inhabitable planet? Well, then I guess a consortium of minds, probably in the scientific area, would transport us uh, away from, from the disaster. And what would happen if you found that, that the sister planet was inhabited by the people with the same basic DNA, but in a basic humanoid with violent tendencies? Hmm. Now wait, wouldn't the aliens also all be violent considering they destroyed their own planet? Oh, no, they didn't destroy their planet. That was celestial. A natural bombardment of the planet's surface that they saw coming, but it was too much volume. It, it not only killed all the life, but also the atmosphere. They're just, life on the planet wasn't even possible after that event. Are you telling me that the intellect on this planet comes from Martians? Yes, and only a privileged few have that knowledge. Okay, saying all this is true, and if it is, this is a revelation of biblical proportions that's gonna rock this planet to its core, why? Why are humans so violent? Because that part of the human brain never left the mix. Even the alien, even the alien race has not been able to eradicate that part of the human brain. All they did was add the factor of intellect and when then combined with the feral brains of the human, all it did was complicate the DNA and made the humans more devious and monumental in their ability to spread hatred. Humans simply bred too quickly to remain under the control of the aliens. Before the advanced intellect arrived, man survived off instinct. They survived like any other Earth predator. They survived on a mix of, of adrenaline and, and induced fear and, and a feral reaction, a violent reaction to that fear. So all human intellect is from aliens? Yes. I have to say, Suzanne, that, that even with my training, this is a, a huge amount to comprehend, uh, even though it makes perfect sense. Yes, it, it does. And what about our belief systems? All alien. But after a period of time, all of the pure aliens died out, uh, leaving mostly the hybrids. The remaining of the breed who are mostly pure end up finding each other through special abilities that they possess through the ancestry of the original intellect. Uh, that's never totally died out. Uh, many of them have created the evolution of our planet due to their enormous intellects. And exactly who would these people be? Confucius, Akhenaten, Marcus Aurelius, Gandhi, Nikola Tesla. It's also said that they had the ability to levitate due to their developed science. However, that technology was ultimately lost Plus, not all of their devices work correctly in this light spectrum and atmosphere. They could only adapt so much with the resources that they had. Yeah, they were travelers after all. They made do with what they had. But you have to admit, to ancient man, they would have been gods. I quite agree. Let me ask you this. How could ancient peoples, well before the time of Galileo or Copernicus, calculate the paths of something as complicated as our solar system when they didn't even understand what it was. How could they track the paths of slow-moving stars and planets 
wouldn't they need time to document this and, and other people to observe and verify those findings over vast periods of time? Okay, Suzanne, I'm, I'm just trying to comprehend this. You believe wholeheartedly that this is the truth, but do you have any data to support it? Yes. And is there anything that was printed? Is there something to document this? No. No, they would track that. Everything we print is not only logged, but it's sent to an unknown location where they monitor all activity by my group. The only reason I even saw it was because it was sent security level 17, which is my security clearance. But that also means that somebody will eventually realize their mistake and I will be in grave danger because the purge clause will be activated. I've already missed two days of work trying to figure out what to do. Now, I'm the only person to whom you've mentioned this. Period. Yes. Excuse me. <clears throat> yeah. It's all been verified. Yeah, yeah. Suzanne, uh, there's uh, someone here to see you. <laughs>